Blockchain, smart contract, DLT and NFT. What about Bitcoin, Ethereum, Cardano or Dogecoin? In the past few years, you may have been bombarded by these terms and tried to get a grasp on this new world in digital finance. In reality, blockchain is a technology that aims to disrupt the global economy through decentralization, and it is already transforming many industries and lives. Hello, I'm Amina Aliu, and this is Our Voices. On this week's show, we will help you to understand cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. We will also examine what financial opportunities it brings to Africa and African women. Before we delve into it, we asked people in Johannesburg, South Africa, about their understanding of cryptocurrency. I don't know nothing about cryptocurrency. I'm joking. <laughs> it's the way it is. But I'm willing to learn, so school me. Well, what I know about um, cryptocurrency is that uh, it's an exchange of money. Um, it's where you can invest your, man, invest your money and make a lot of profit. Um, and also, you know, we have, we have two types. Of, I think um, we have uh, a market. Uh, a market, a stock market, and also a crypto, which is a, um, two different things. Um, on the stock market, it's where basically you can trade for yourself, while on the crypto, it's whereby you can mostly invest on, just like um, the Bitcoin. Cryptocurrency, isn't it? That Bitcoin, Shandis. I don't know much about cryptocurrency, but I know that you actually take some coins and you put them in some other coins and makes more, and make more coins, something like that. So what is cryptocurrency? Let's take Bitcoin as an example. In 2008, an anonymous person or group named Satoshi Nakamoto invented it with blockchain technology. Agents France Press produced an animation allowing us to peek into the world of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a purely online currency created from computer code in circulation since 2009. The identity of its creator or creators remains a mystery. Unlike traditional currencies, it has no central bank, nor is it backed by any government. Instead, its community of users control and regulate it via the blockchain, a shared public ledger on which the entire Bitcoin network relies. It's a mathematical process designed to provide anonymous and secure transfers. To get started, users can install a Bitcoin wallet on their computer or phone, which generates an address unique to each transaction. They can use this to buy goods and services or other currencies. Each transaction is validated by members of the community by tracing the origin of each Bitcoin using special software. This is known as mining. The process is intended to ensure that no single Bitcoin can be spent in more than one place simultaneously. Members of the network, known as miners, are pitted against one another as they race to solve increasingly complex cryptograms on extremely powerful computers. The fastest to do so are issued with new Bitcoins as a reward for their efforts. This is the only way new Bitcoins can be created. There is a limit, however, to how many can be created, capped at 21 million units, and three quarters are already in circulation. The cryptocurrency has a number of advantages. Transactions are anonymous, transfers are almost instantaneous and free from charges. There's no price cap and no middleman. Bitcoin is not without problems, however. Transactions are irreversible and it's an extremely volatile currency, subject to wild fluctuations in price. Security is also an issue, with digital wallets stored on computers or phones vulnerable to theft by hackers. The anonymous nature of Bitcoin also makes it a popular currency for illegal transactions. According to Chain Analysis, a leading blockchain data platform, Adoption of crypto in Africa surged 1,200% between July 2020 and June 2021. It is the third fastest growing cryptocurrency economy. Africa has witnessed some of the highest grassroots adoption in the world 
with Kenya, Nigeria, South Africa, and Tanzania being the hubs of this booming industry. To help us understand how cryptocurrency found its niche in Africa and how grassroots adopters migrate risk, we invited Olua Shewu Craig Adeonju, a seasoned financial business and technology writer in Nigeria, to be a part of our broadcast. Also joining us today is VOA's award-winning multimedia producer, Azuma Kompori. I'm going to go to Craig. Can you tell us about the overall outlook of Africa as the continent with the highest cryptocurrency adoption rate? So, so I think there are two major factors driving, uh, fundamental factors driving crypto adoption in Africa. Uh, and I think they're sort of interconnected. Uh, the first is uh, we see a lot of inflation, a lot of African countries. Uh, and then you see people losing their buying power. Uh, like in real, in real time, you go from month to month to, uh, to shop for groceries and then the prices are, are significantly higher than what uh, you spent the, the previous month. And, and then the second one is, you know, just to benefit from the, should I say the wealth creation opportunities that cryptocurrency uh, provides in terms of the increase in price of uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever coin is there in the market. So, and then we, I, and I think one thing about Africans is that because of the, uh, we are not the wealthiest, right? And I, uh, many of us see cryptocurrency as an opportunity to uh, get in early on a very uh, uh, disruptive technology and benefit uh, uh, financially for the long term. Um, my next question is to our very own Aruzuma. With regards to the launch of the e-Naira by Nigeria, what kind of implication do you think it's going to have on the markets of the country and the whole continent at large? Uh, thank you for uh, for having me. I think the the Inaira is uh, is first of all you have to look at it as a, a way for the government, Nigerian government, to try to to stay on top of uh, something that is is coming. You know, to change the way we utilize uh, you know currencies in general. Um, the Inaira is is really at the same time we say E for digital, but it still keeps all the uh, the, the principle that you know the government needs. To be able to regulate, you know, efficiently um, in the currencies uh, that he, he he has in charge. So at the same time, when we're talking about crypto, we're talking about something that is more decentralized than anything, right? We're talking about uh, a technology that is just going away from <laughs> regulation. So that's where the dichotomy, that's where the controversy is a little bit, you know, laying to my taste. Um, but uh, you remember Nigeria, it's, it's, you know, 200 millions, you know, plus, you know, people uh, today. And uh, it's a huge market, a lot of possibilities, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, elements that are at stake. At the same time, and there's the risk that, you know, a lot of this um, that is not regulated can become pretty quick, you know, uh, out, of, out of control. You know, so that's the that's the worry that uh, I think uh, not only Nigeria but a lot of governments uh, around the continent are already seeing. That's you know why they're not that quick to to move on on digital currency. The the digital currency part is something that is very appealing because you know you you have the flexibility of uh, you know you know the fluidity of digital, but. Um, making the move to, to, to go into crypto or, you know, even adopting a blockchain technology where you would be more decentralized than anything. I don't think it's something that, uh, you know, a lot of government are that excited to. And I'm going to go back to Craig. So have you met people that benefit from cryptocurrency in their day-to-day -day life? Yeah, I've met a lot of people who have benefited from cryptocurrency in different ways from people who are remote workers and uh, they work uh, remotely for companies around the world. Uh, cryptocurrency has made it easier for a lot of them to get paid. And I've also seen people who have, have been able to get uh, employed to crypto companies right while working right in this country. So that was like, that's, uh, should I say, kind of employment that didn't exist uh, uh, about a decade ago. Then for payments, personally, I've enjoyed, I've benefited from that uh, faster payment because uh, what, what, one of the things that cryptocurrency did for, for Africans is it, it sort of, in an improved way, connected us to the global economy. And then, so I think that is the second one in addition to job creation. 
And then of course, people who have just benefited uh, from, should I say, straight out from the gains uh, in cryptocurrency, you know, uh, you have 20% gain in Bitcoin today, people who are in the market, so I've met those kind of people. And I think, yeah, I've, I've, I've definitely met people who, who have benefited. So back to Arzuma. Um, generally, women tend to take a back seat when it comes to investment, share stocks, you know, we tend to get confused by these kinds of things. However, with cryptocurrency, we've seen an inclusiveness and significant participation of women in the cryptocurrency market. What do you think the reason behind this is and how inclusive do you think it is for women? Uh, it's a very interesting uh, aspect you're raising here. Uh, it's true. I, I've spoken to a couple of uh, women that are pretty much leading the, the uh, cryptocurrency in Africa. Why this is happening is because a lot of uh, uh, women are seeing that, uh, that as a way to earn back the power. The importance of looking beyond, you know, utilizing cryptocurrency. It's, it's, it's not just the, um, how do you say that, the payment aspect, but it's also the protection aspect, the data privacy, it is also the investment capabilities. It's time for a short break. Did cryptocurrency make it easier for you to transfer money or provide a new source of income? Please share your views on our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Our handle is at VOA Our Voices. We are also on WhatsApp. Our number is on your screen. Coming up, how did women in Africa become the champions of leading the crypto cause in a traditional boys club We'll have more on the cryptocurrency conversation in a moment. Empowerment and humanity towards a better world. Economic and social progress of every society. Facts and information from key players rather than spectators in politics, business, science and technology. City, rural, educated, all underprivileged. We care and we listen to what matters to you. Your voices are our voices. Welcome back. You're watching Our Voices. The financial industry bears the reputation as being a boys club, with 80% or more of the participants being male. But female leaders are pushing an education campaign on the subject throughout the entire continent, and many African women are finding their way into positions in crypto finance. Nigeria is recording massive growth in its information technology sector, but only one-fifth of internet technology workers are women, according to government figures. Aid groups are trying to help women and girls enter the IT world by teaching them about blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies. Timothy Obiezu reports from Abuja. 60-year-old Elizabeth Onaji arrives for weekly cryptocurrency training for women in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. She says she enrolled in June to learn more about blockchain technology. I, I believe that this is a worldwide um, uh, project, do I say project or, or business. Nigeria should not be the odd one out. We should also key into the global trend. Janet Cartier runs for blockchain classes. She began free blockchain education for women in 2017 and says hundreds of Nigerian women have benefited from the training. Yes, I'm always interested in teaching women so that they can also be part of what is happening in the, in the technology space, you understand? And then you come to see a lot of women, mothers, are interested, are already taking this blockchain technology and making life out of it. Some are housewife, some are even working. But like in many sectors, women are underrepresented in Nigeria's technology sector. Nigeria's Statistics Bureau says less than a fifth of IT workers are women, despite major growth in the industry over the last decade. Katia's efforts are aimed at addressing this problem. Nigeria is Africa's biggest blockchain market. In this training, she partnered with the non-profit T'Challa Foundation to teach women about an African cryptocurrency called T'Challa that was introduced in November. T'Challa is a hero that is coming up from Africa. 
and to save Africa. And what we're trying to say is that it's time for Africa to have a voice in the blockchain uh, space and also Africa to have a voice when it comes to cryptocurrency. However, blockchain technology experts say government policies could prove a challenge. When you speak to people about cryptocurrency, they will try to remind you the government said it's not good for us. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's, it's a big uh, barrier and uh, people tend to follow that. In February, Nigerian authorities warned citizens against cryptocurrencies, saying they were unstable, and later in October, launched a digital currency known as the E-Naira. But despite the risks and odds, women like Elizabeth and Katio will be promoting cryptocurrencies and giving access to many others. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Women are now crypto trailblazers in Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, Botswana, and Zimbabwe. Why does Africa see a higher female representation in this industry? And what opportunities does blockchain technology present to women in Africa? Our Voices producer, Abby Sun, spoke with Yaliwe Soko, chairwoman of United Africa Blockchain Association in South Africa, and also technology entrepreneur, Nelly Chateau Diop from Cameroon. For those of our audience are old enough to remember in 1994 the devaluation of CFA franc. Nelly, you were personally affected by this. Fast track 20 years later, in your own words, you met Bitcoin. So tell us very quickly uh, what led you to start this trading platform in Cameroon called Ija. Um, a little bit more than 20 years ago, uh, the decision was made uh, by you know foreign countries to devalue uh, the CFA fund and this pretty much affected uh, a world generation like 14 countries sharing the same currency overnight they just lost purchasing power because obviously most of the goods that are, that were consumed back then in Africa and still today are imported goods when I fell in love with blockchain back in 2015 I saw in it uh, a premise for a fairer world, a better world, where people like us, people like the community, I come from in Cameroon, Ivory Coast, Senegal, all those 14 countries could retake back ownership over their wealth and could even start dreaming about, you know, trading with the world uh, without any discrimination, without, with complete transparency and without, you know, a fear of censorship. Now, Yaliwe, I want to go to you. You had a different path. You worked different jobs. Eventually, um, you found your passion back to IT and now um, cryptocurrency and blockchain technology. And I also want to learn a little bit more about um, what does um, the organization you created, United African uh, Blockchain Association, does? I actually was working in the oil and gas industry. And then uh, there was actually a rumor that the company I was working for might close. So I had a few things laying on my table and I asked myself, where, where to from here, right? Um, I had no college degree. I actually had a part-time job, kind of like a call center type of thing. And I got paid in Bitcoin. And with the research, I found that I developed um, what I would call a personal curriculum. At first it was for personal use, but then I started using that same document to educate others. And the, really the main goal was to unify the African blockchain ecosystem because we believed a lot of people were doing so many different things and we wanted to do this through education first, but also in line with uh, the United Nations SDGs. Uh, last year alone, we educated over 2,000 Africans for free. Oh, wow. Uh, so, so we've got an upcoming uh, program called uh, How to Spot a Scam, right? So we're going to be educating people on that as well so that they don't fall, you know, they don't fall prey to all these uh, scams that are coming on the market. And the beauty is that all our representatives came out of our class and every time they came out of the class, they came and asked, so how do I give back? How do I uh, become part of it? So we're really focused on that. Education. That becomes a positive cycle, right? I think both of you would agree that um, education is definitely the primary driver of uh, adoption of blockchain and technology and cryptocurrency. Nelly, in your personal experience, uh, what kind of 
misunderstanding or myth you experience、um, during the education campaign? So the first challenge、uh, you have to overcome while educating people about crypto is it is not a way to get rich overnight. It's really like a philosophy you have to embrace. It's a new technology similar to the likes of internet many years ago that will change everything the way we transfer value. Another thing that is good with、uh, pushing education is that. Women usually have a tendency not to embrace something new when they feel like they don't have like a complete understanding of it. The last thing I will say, the last piece about education is infrastructure because when you educate about vision and want to demonstrate how it works, you need internet, you need some kinds of smartphone or a computer. So now you are facing challenges、uh, in most part of Africa where you face electricity shortages. Internet is still very costly for a lot of people. Not everyone has smartphones, even if the price has been driven. So those kind of things, like having a center and the tiny information that I got during this first training, make me so interested, and I see the value in it. I think you mentioned a really interesting point that compared to other markets, Africa has seen much higher. Percentage of participation from women. Can you both share with us,、uh, with your own experience, how does、uh, cryptocurrency and blockchain technology can bring more financial opportunities for women in Africa?、Uh, okay, absolutely. So I'll go first. I, I guess.、Um, I think on my part, it's I've, I've looked at blockchain and crypto being an equalizer, right? Like、um, I'll, I'll give you this thing. I I I just came here and I said、um, I had no college degree when I got into this, but it、right. gives you an opportunity to be able to sit at the same table as somebody with a PhD because right now there's no expert in this field. So it 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 actually brought a lot of、uh, interest and also I think women started seeing other women, right. Doing this thing, so there's one thing I'll always say: is that people need their own heroes. They need people who look just like them, doing something, and then they'll look at it and say, "Hey, I can also do that." And if you look at the African system, so especially our parents were growing up, there were certain jobs that were just for men, and there were certain jobs that were for women. So you find that the boss is going to be a man, the CEO is going to be a man, and most of the time the secretary is a woman, right? Right. The doctor is going to be a man. The nurse is usually a woman. Is a so woman. there are certain roles that were defined for, for exactly for women, and there are certain jobs that were defined for men. This has given us an opportunity to be able to do what men can do because we're all learning. We're at a point where everybody's learning. There's no expert in this. It's a fresh、learning. start for everyone. One thing that I've noticed is that、um, in many societies, I'm, I'm, I was born and raised in, in Cameroon, and I'm here right now. In many of our societies in Africa, still women do not have the rights to own a land, for example. The ownership proposition, real ownership for the first time of an asset, it's really something that is dear to a lot of them. For the first time, you can have your own bitcoin in your own wallet, and nobody knows about it. For some women that still work and are able to save a little bit of money, usually, you know, eighty percent of transactions are. Is still are still done by cash in my in, in my community. So a lot of them will save their cash, and then their brothers, their fathers, or their boyfriends will just come beat them up and steal it. But now, what if they save it for crypto? You know, like who knows? Like you're not gonna be stealing like they are in the money. I mean, you're not even gonna know that they have any any money aside. They are even safer. It provides not only freedom, not only like an advancement of women rights, but it also it's a security because nobody knows what money you have. It's time for a break, but when we come back, artists and fans are taking an increasing interest in non fungible tokens, also known as NFTs. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching our voices. Since an artist garnered sixty-nine million dollars earlier this year for a digital artwork titled "Blockchain Technology," artists and fans have taken an increasing interest in so-called non-fungible tokens. 
Tina Trin explores the technology that's disrupting the art world. The worlds of art and technology were on display at a recent show in New York City. I think the best and most talented artists have always looked to technology, to new formats, to be able to take their art to the next level. That includes turning digital art into non-fungible tokens, or NFTs, digital collectibles linked to blockchains, encrypted distributed ledgers that validate their origins and authenticity. Liz Yang works at Definity, a nonprofit with its own blockchain network called the Internet Computer. Definity helps artists turn their works into NFTs, which are minted, traded, and sold on the platform. From a provenance perspective, you would know exactly like where the art originated from and where, where it's been sold, like into perpetuity, essentially. That's important for digital art, which is typically easy to copy. Owners of NFTs hold the authorized original art in a digital wallet. In addition to giving digital artists more exposure, NFTs allow them to make money in different ways. There are a lot of cases where artists sell art at a time where they're not that famous. And then later on down the line in the secondary markets, the art sells for many, many multiples more, but they don't reap any of the rewards. Blockchain platforms use smart contracts that are programmed to execute transactions based on certain conditions. Because it's code, you can stipulate in the code that artists receive a percentage cut of every secondary market transaction thereafter. Critics say the buzz around NFTs make it a highly speculative market, and it remains to be seen whether the current movement is a bubble that will eventually burst. Still, artists like Neil White are excited for the new medium. It's pretty fun to kind of feel like I'm sort of making art in like more, a more like futuristic form. And that future may well be filled with NFTs. Tina Trin, VOA News, New York. And that's where we'll end this week's program. For more on how cryptocurrency is changing lives, please visit VOA's website at voanews.com. Thanks to my colleagues here on Our Voices, and on behalf of everyone here at The Voice of America, thank you for watching. I'm Amina Aliyu. See you next time. Oh,